Jesus the Egyptian. Please do not miss this episode. Make sure you guys watch it through because I want to hear your opinions and thoughts at the end. I will be looking through the comment section. Lena Einhorn takes us through a couple of her books that she discusses some interesting topics. We cover everything from who is Jesus really, according to the historical record, Josephus and the shift in time and how the gospel narratives don't match. She has graphs. We're going to do further shows where she goes through presentations. I love this lady. She is wonderful. Please go down in the description, check out her books in the uh, Amazon link. Make sure you guys get it. A Shift in Time and the Jesus Mystery. This woman is brilliant. So I hope you guys subscribe to the channel, like this. This is truly fascinating what she brings to the table. I've never heard anything like this pertaining to Jesus and looking at the errors in the New Testament. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, your host, Derek Lambert. Today, we have a shift in time with Lena Einhorn. How are you doing? Um, well, thank you. I'm glad you came to join me. Some of my audience has mentioned you, and I try to be a good host the best I can. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, ma'am. So I read I read some of that paper that you sent me, and I'm currently going through a different book that you have, of course, but uh, on Audible, because I have a hard time sitting and reading. I can listen better than I can sit and read um, this new generation of us, you know, the way we are. However, you have to wash the dishes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I am actually astounded at what you've what you've done and simplified something that was very interesting to me that the historical Jesus is missing from history. Now, we start with that idea that the Gospels, we aren't really counting, you know, when something's that fictitious and so much, I don't want to use that in, the, in a derogatory sense, but so much allegory, so much parabolic language, it's metaphorical, it, it's, it seems like it's not literal history. When we can't find this guy... What are we doing? You know, how, how are we going to figure this out? And you go to Josephus and you go to other historians. So I want you to introduce yourself, of course, to the audience, but also tell them what you get. Let's get into the discussion of what this is all about. Oh, uh, this is hmm. there are several points in time when it comes to this hypothesis. It really started many, many years ago, and I'm not going to go into the beginning because it sort of evolved. Um, let me in instead say that um, even if it wasn't the impetus, that the, the reasoning behind the hypothesis is really the thing that uh, everybody is basing their hypothesis or non-hypothesis about Jesus on, namely that you cannot find him outside of the New Testament in real time. It, 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 you know, during the first century, uh, if you accept Testimonium Flavianum, which uh, which is a paragraph um, uh, in 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 Jewish Antiquities by Josephus, which almost everybody says is it is to some extent a falsification, or is it is some you know, people vary as to how much different it is from what what is the original but at least it's not the, it wasn't originally there as it's written outside of that you really don't find jesus in the first century historical texts outside of the outside of the gospel texts uh, the new testament texts and so you know so there are two main hypotheses uh, one is okay he was sort of one of the many messianic claimants and and you know in that was a tumultuous century and he's just buried in there with the rest which is sort of the majority view um, among scholars and then there's a minority view which basically says no he never existed at all it's all fiction now now on that note I, I... I just like to plug so we have a good dialogue. This is going to be an introductory show because yeah. I honestly think a series, you could do a series on this show because I, I was blown away on your paperwork. P focusing on that, <clears throat> I, I would like to ask you to please name some of your books for our audience. Some people are not familiar with some of your works that you have written. 
on these things. I'll have them down in the description so that they can click the Amazon link and get a hold of them. What are some of your books you've written? Well, I'm, I'm basically, I mean, my background is, is not as, as a biblical scholar at all. I'm, I'm an MD, PhD by training. Uh, but many years ago, I shifted to doing uh, documentary uh, filming, and I'm presently mostly working as an author. I have two books that are published on the historical Jesus, and they both deal with the time shift. Uh, both of them, no, the first one was written originally in Swedish. It came out in 2006. Uh, it was in Swedish, you know, the translated title was uh, What Happened on the Road to Damascus. In English, it became The Jesus Mystery with a lengthy subtitle that I don't remember, but it was called The Jesus Mystery. Now, uh, after that was published, uh, and in English, it came out in 2007, for a number of years, I went to the Society of Biblical Literature conferences, and they accepted my abstracts, and, and I... I was allowed to present, so I, I did maybe five or six presentations over a few years at the Society of Biblical Literature International and Annual Meetings of this hypothesis. And, and there was something happened. It was really, really interesting what happened. Um, when I was in the seminar room and I presented it as a PowerPoint presentation, it was like it was completely quiet. Everybody followed me. Everybody knew what I was doing. The questions that came afterwards were incredibly relevant. Everybody was with me. Um, always somebody would come up to me and said, why hasn't this been published in a journal? I'll help you do it, or you should contact this person or whatever. And then when the seminar was over and the door closed it was as if it never happened and wow. this repeated itself over and over again and when i contacted you know there were quite a few people at said there were these were a number of seminars when i if i contacted them afterwards it was like it Who never happened <laughs> <laughs> it was very it was very fascinating um and it wasn't disturbing as much as it was um it was interesting and it was a confirmation of how people's minds work when we encounter things that make sense but don't fit with our preconceived notions or our ideas of what truth is um uh it's just very interesting and it and it's certainly true in science as well, and perhaps more than anything in, in biblical science, because it's connected to faith. Um, in any event, so I kept having these presentations. Um, and in the end, I decided, no, I'll, I'll publish a second book where I assemble more of the data I had. Because the first book, The Jesus Mystery, as it's called in English, is more of a... It's, it's more of a literary piece, and I decided, okay, I'll make it written in a popular way, but I'll put in all the evidence that I'm presenting in, in this uh, uh, scholarly context. And you, that became a shift in time, and that was published in 2016. You actually sent me the, the article on this, right? This is the, Right. That's okay. the, that's the article that, that, that came out of the presentations at the, at the Society of Biblical Literature. I want to talk about that. I mean, let's let's go into some meat, if you don't mind, because sure. <clears throat> first of all, for our audience who hasn't read this, you you really should get the book. Um, I was astounded. I love it because that's what we entertain on this show. We're big on finding out like who is Jesus. Was he a rebel leader? Was he uh, just a faith healer? You know, trying to figure out who the guy was, which you you do a good job in this uh, in this article and in in the book. I'm certain this is the condensed version, so to speak. Jesus, first of all, he doesn't fit in the 30s. It, he doesn't fit in this right. window. And you do a good job by going to these other people. Like the book of Acts talks about the Egyptian. The book of Acts talks about Judah, the Galilean, okay, or Judas, however you want to pronounce his name. These, these actual people who existed in history in Josephus, you find these guys and you're like following their... They're, they're cookie crumbs. You know, you're, you're saying, okay, well, here they are. And 
you're using details of the robbers. You mention a term robbers that is utilized in the New Testament and in Josephus. And you do this fascinating thing where you go, where's it at? And there's charts. These charts are showing before the 30s, like in the beginning, you know, very first century beginnings, you have all these activities and these terms being used in Josephus, talking about historical stuff. Then you have after that in the 50s and 60s. And it's like, where's it going on under the Pontius Pilate situation? Exactly. What does that do to the extra biblical historical context of stuff from Tacitus and Suetonius? How does that affect the Crestus who's being killed in the 30s, supposedly, if Josephus isn't even really going, hey, guys, look, it's right here. I don't understand. But, I mean, what you're talking about is evidence from the second century. It's, you know, you're not talking about, I mean, Josephus is the only person who is writing at the same time as the gospel authors, mainly. He is, he is really, and not only is he writing at the same time, but he is the, I mean, any other source looking at this period and looking at this geographical place is is minuscule compared to Josephus. He really covered it. And and what is so fascinating when you and that's why everybody is comparing the New Testament with Josephus, because that's the source. And all they find is testimonium Flavianum, which, you know, is sort of not wasn't there from the beginning. I mean, we, we don't have to go into all the evidence there. It's plenty of evidence. Right. Uh, in in any event. So the thing, when I started writing the first book, I, I was doing it because of another hypothesis I was exploring. And I decided that I was just going to do this comparison. I was just going to start from the beginning. I was just going to do what everybody else was doing. And then these weirds, this weird stuff kept popping up. You know, it's like it wasn't only that Jesus wasn't there or his disciples or Christianity wasn't there in Josephus, but the people, the famous people from the New Testament, you know, all the dignitaries and the high priests and the, and the, and this, and the emperors and the procurators and the prefects, you know, the names were there in Josephus, but hey, they weren't doing the stuff that, that is described in the New Testament. It was like, nothing fit. It wasn't only that that Jesus wasn't there, but it was like these, you know, like there were no two high priests, and Caiaphas and Annas, they weren't the high priests together. I mean, they were separated by three high priests. They never ruled together. I mean, there were lots of these things. I mean, uh, uh, that Pilate was killing Galileans. I mean, Pilate wasn't even ruling Galilee. I mean, there were, there were all these loads and loads of things that weren't fitting with the dignitaries. But the funny thing was that there were things that fitted with the dignitaries, but 20 years later. And, and you know, it's, it was like this thing when it, it for me, the, the interesting thing is that when I started writing the book, I came two thirds through the book until uh, we say in Swedish that the, the coin drops. Well, I guess maybe it suddenly was a late night. Basically, what happened was um, there were all these chronological things that were not correct in, in the 30s. They weren't there. I mean, robbers. There were no robbers in the 30s. There isn't a single robber mentioned by, by Josephus between six, the year 6 and the year 44. None, but they are very much present before and they're very much present after. No crucifixions between between four and forty-six. No crucifixion, but before, yes, and and afterwards, yes. And there were loads of things that you know just wasn't there when it was supposed to be there. And then there was this guy, the Egyptian. It sounded an awful lot like Jesus. He spent time in the wilderness, just like Jesus. He was called the Egyptian. There was an Egyptian connection to Jesus. He gathered his disciples where? On the Mount of Olives, which is where Jesus gathered his disciples. He 
preached to his disciples that he was going to tear down the walls of Jerusalem. Very similar to what Jesus was preaching. The, he was perceived, the Egypt, and, if, and the interesting thing is that if you look at the 30s, there isn't a single messianic claimant or a single um, leader, religious leader mentioned uh, at that period. But the Egyptian is one of those that is mentioned as one of the major leaders He's in both uh, Jewish antiquities and uh, War of the Jews, Jewish War. Uh, so he's a big one, but he was in the 50s. He was not in the 30s. And then there were a few things that didn't fit. There were many things that did fit, but there were a couple of things that didn't fit. First of all, the Egyptian was not crucified. What is said is that just like Jesus, he was defeated, or whatever you want to call it, on the Mount of Olives, exactly the same spot. And he was perceived as a threat by the authorities. The big difference is that whereas Jesus was resting and, and with his disciples, and then he was arrested, uh, resting and arrested by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, the, the people sent out by the Jewish council. This is not what happened with the Egyptian. What happened with the Egyptian was that... Uh, the procurator, who wasn't Pilate at that time, it was Felix, he sent out uh, Roman soldiers, a cohort of Roman soldiers, to fight against the Egyptian and all his disciples up on the Mount of Olives. And it was a big battle, and a lot of people were killed. This is what Josephus described. And then he says, but the Egyptian escaped out of the fight, and he was not heard from again. Now. I kept putting in, I just, in those first chapters of, of, of the book, because I was making this, I was writing as I was being perplexed. So I kept putting in this the Egyptian. It's awfully weird how similar he is to Jesus, but hey, it's in the 50s. It's not, it's, a, and then late one night, it's really late at night. Um, I am sitting with the, Greek, I don't know Greek, but I sit with the sort of parallel Greek translation of John, of the description of the Gospel of John, of how Jesus is arrested. And there's a difference between John and the Synoptic Gospels in the description of the arrest. Because in the Synoptic Gospels, you know, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, the men come up and they arrest Jesus. In John, it says that the men from the Jewish council is accompanied by the Spera and the Chiliarchos. Now, in the translations, all the Swedish translations, English translations, it's like the captain and the guard. But that's not what it means. A Spera is a Roman cohort of 1,000 soldiers. And the Chiliarchos means a leader of 1,000. The, the Roman soldiers that, according to John, not according to Josephus, was sent up to arrest Jesus <laughs> were a thousand men, okay? That is a battle. That's not arresting a resting man. That is a battle. And the interesting thing about the New Testament is that it's written there too. But it's, it's as subtext. It's written in subtext. And there are hits. Once you sort of make the connection, you see it. You see in Luke that Jesus tells his disciples to bring swords up to the Mount of Olives. And you see that uh, someone is cutting the ear of that. You know, you, 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 you have the signals there. But you don't, you sort of gloss over them until you get the full picture. And it's like, it's like an autostereogram. I don't know if you call it that in English, like when you, when you read the text of the New Testament, all you see is the surface. And then you see all these weird little things like the, the names of these, of these rebel leaders thrown into the text and you don't understand why and you just gloss over it. One of them is the Egyptian is in the New Testament. It's in Acts. Uh, and you see Judas the Galilean 
and you see theaters and they're all thrown into it. You see that that the birth of Jesus is uh, during the tax census under Quirinius. And you know what was born under the tax, at the tax census under Quirinius? The Jewish rebel movement. That's when it was born. Mm. So, 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 so what you see is you see all, you see the New Testament is written in layers. Okay. And I'm now writing a book. I'm almost finished. I'm almost done with it. Um, it's coming out this fall. It's in Swedish so far. And it's about the Old Testament. The, the interesting thing that I find is that, and I, I want to say this because it's, it's important, I think, you know, and, and it has to do also with the whole idea of mythicism, etc. Now, when you don't find something, you either say, well, you know, it's so long ago, we don't have the evidence. Or you say it's all invented, it's all fiction. But what I really, uh, I really believe now, after having worked on both the New and the Old Testament, is that the people who wrote these texts, they had to satisfy two needs. One was a religious need to to congregate people around, you know, a vision of, of God and and you know prophets, whatever. It, they had to have a story that fitted the, the the movement and the religion, but they had another need too, and that was to tell history. They wanted to tell history, and so they had to, in order to, and these two needs, they didn't gel often because history wasn't always fitting into the needs of the religion. Sometimes it didn't fit at all. And so then what they would do is they would tell the story on the surface and then they would, under the surface, they would tell the other story. And the only reason you could see the other story that I felt that I could see the other story in the New Testament was because I put Josephus on top of it and I shifted, but I had to shift it. And when I looked through the prism of Josephus at the New Testament, the whole story you know, it sort of came up from below, if you understand what I'm saying. And suddenly, you know, when John then says that there is a, a thousand soldiers and and the, and the commander coming up to the Mount of Olives, it's not he's not it's not crap. It means something. Well, you know, something interesting looking at that passage, just because I can remember off the, I, mean, I don't have the passage right in front of me, but, you know, it's like he turns and I think he says something or something. I can't remember. And they all fall like they're dead. Which is just a funny fictional, there's something there as to why they're saying that these Romans just, they just fall. Like they're dead at the feet of Jesus. But then they get back up and then they arrest him and he almost seems like he's in total control of the situation, how they how they fictionalize it here in John. In John. I, I think it's beautiful what you're doing. Um, I don't think your your motives are at all bad. I think your motives are driven in the right direction of really trying to figure it out. I mean, who who hasn't watched mystery videos and movies and thought, what if I can find the Ark of the Covenant? You know, and this is a different type of Ark of the Covenant, if you will, figuring out the enigma of the New Testament. Let's let's discuss something not here. Only, I, oh, not only the New Testament. I mean, I really think this is, you know, history is a new thing. It, right. Herodotus was 400 BC. You know, there was no history before then, no, no epic history. But there was, there were these religious tales, thousands of years of religious tales, and they had history too. And I really, really believe that you don't make up these stories for, for no reason. They aren't made up, but they had to be fitted with the religious tale. And that made an adjustment necessary. As far as, and I, I guess I, I want to jump and ask you, just point blank, why not? Um, do you, well, two-point two question. Do you believe that there was an actual historical Jesus? If so, who was he? All right, which is which is part of that. Let's just start there. Let's just start there. Yes, I do believe there was a historical Jesus. I believe he was the Egyptian, uh, but not only the Egyptian, but <laughs> for... For now, let's <laughs> stick with it. That's what, <laughs> see, see, this is the issue that I have, Lena. And, and look, I totally agree with you. In fact, I've coined a phrase, histomythicist, 
Okay. No, but I, I'm not gonna. Uh, you know what? I, if you're gonna say that it's a, it's a con, it's a, what, what do you call well, it? They use more than no, one. No, you no, think no, it's no, primarily no, I do one? Think he is. Okay. I really do think he is the Egyptian. Okay. But I think that the New Testament, in its incredibly clever way, it's not that there are several people who are Jesus. It is that uh, the Egyptian is several people in the New Testament. <laughs> All you right, understand. all right. So I like you that. Get the difference. Primarily, it is the Egyptian. Now, does... it's the Egyptian. It is the Egyptian. No, it's. I would say it's a hundred percent the Egyptian. And they just but added some things onto they, him. Right, but Jesus. But there are several people in the New Testament who's Egyptian. Barabbas is also Jesus. You know what Barabbas means? Son of the Father. Yeah, and his name in Matthew is Jesus Barabbas. Okay, so. The guy, the rebel leader, Barabbas, who's a robber and is, escapes out of the situation, uh, his name is Jesus, son of the father. Mm. <laughs> this is he fun. He escapes out of the fight just like the Egyptian. But, but you know, this is what I'm telling you. It, this is what I feel, that... The the truth is there in the New Testament too. So if 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 the Egyptian wasn't crucified, then there is someone in the New Testament who wasn't crucified as well, because the whole history is there. Interesting way of looking at. It. I never would have thought about it like this. So so let me ask you. I guess getting to the next obvious question I have, since this is about the shift in time, I'm not going to title it that. I want more people to see this. I want as many possible people who are watching this show to click this button and listen to what you just said. Here here's one of the things I want to ask you. Do you think they purposely and for theological, num numerological, religious purposes? placed it in the 30s so that it was exactly one generation away from the temple's destruction, that 40-year gap into the 30s under Pilate, so that there's that 40 years like in the, the wilderness with Moses idea being repeated here? I I don't know. I haven't thought about that, and, and I'm not sure. I can tell you why I think they moved it from the 50s. Please um, do. I cannot say for sure why they moved it to the 30s. My... My reasoning behind, well, first of all, why did they move it? Because they didn't want a competition and, and, and Josephus was publishing and, and he was a famous guy in those days. And he wasn't the only one. Uh, Justice from, of Tiberius was also publishing, although his, his writings are lost. But, you know, there were competing narratives of the same period and of the same people. That is my explanation why they would move it so that there would not be competing narratives. Now, why they moved it to the 30s? Maybe another reason they could have moved it to the 30s is because there was no there there in the 30s. There was no, <laughs> there were no robbers. There were no other messianic leaders. There was, there were nothing in history that, that could, you know, it was empty, so to speak, not empty. I mean, but, but, a lot of the stuff that that is present in the in the fifties and then much more as you approach the Jewish war and that are elements of of the New Testament text like crucifixions and robbers and things like that they're not there in the thirties and so it's an empty period it's a it's a hole that you could fill that was my interpretation I mean there could be other in, you know interpretations of that there was a symbolic meaning to the thirties I don't know you know I don't. I, this isn't finished. I mean, every time I look at Josephus, I see another link to this. Uh -huh. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't seen it all. You know, I mean, there are lots of stuff there. You, you, every time. I mean, I'm sure that every line in the New Testament means something. Every word is there for a reason. Nothing is just thrown in there for no reason. Uh, but you can, it's not always so easy to find it because it's so cleverly put, put there. And not everything is 20 years later. The, the main story is 20 years later. But you find the Jewish war in there, too. There are, there are, there are parallels to the Jewish war. In, in, and I have in, in, uh, both in the book, A Shift in Time, and in the paper, 
a lengthy parallel between acts and the story uh, of of, uh, of of Peter and when they're when they're preaching in the temple after the crucifixion, and and something that's happening at the beginning of the Jewish war with Menahem, who was a, a, a rebel leader, and you put them next to each other, and it's, it's not one parallel, it's not two parallel, it's not three parallels, it's like thirty parallels or at least twenty five. It's it's so convincing that this is you know it's statistically very strong that these are two parallel narratives, but it's not that's not twenty years later that's the Jewish war, and so every time, every time I, I look at it, I, I I see a new thing, and what I really think is the consistent story historical narrative of the New Testament is the story of the Jewish rebellion against Rome. And the Egyptian is fit at a particular time there, which is in the 50s. That's the time of the Egyptian. But there is other stuff in there. I mean, as I said, they throw in Theodos in the, and, and, and just take Theodos. I mean, Theodos is really <laughs> interesting because once you see that there's a parallel between the Egyptian and Jesus, and you say, oh, okay, who's the guy that came before the Egyptian? Well, the last messianic leader that that uh, Josephus mentions before the Egyptian is Theodos. Okay, now who was Theodos? Well, Theodos was this messianic leader, rebel leader who gathered people where by the Jordan River. But the uh, the authorities, which is the it's not Herod Antipas in this case, it's it's Fadus, who's a, who's a Roman procurator, they, he doesn't like him, so he sends out all these soldiers. And what do they do with Theodos? They cut off his head and they carry it to Jerusalem. I mean, this is, oh, uh, guys, this is great. This is great. I love this. So this, all of it, like you said, it fits this puzzle. And and Theodos, I mean, it, it all these details makes me ask because I'm sure you go to Judah. We might as well go to Judas, the Galilean too, while we're here and have you discuss that before I get to a point I think where I'd like to ask some other questions. But does what else is Theodos? Because this is John the Baptist obviously pictured here, beheaded by Herod the Great, correct, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, and, Herod Antipas in the in the in the Gospels, but right. but but fathers in, in Josephus. I didn't mean the great, sorry. But so totally different people. Exactly. But that's the whole thing. So how do you shift something in time? How do you do that? There's only one way to do that because we didn't, the, the, at, those, in those, at, at that time, you didn't have, you know, BCE or, or CE or whatever you want to call it. You had dignitaries. That's how you had time, how you fixed time. It's the X year of Tiberius's reign. It's, uh, you know, that's how you fixed time. And so the only way to present a time is by presenting a dignitary and the year of his, usually, <laughs> reign. That's the only way to present time. So how do you shift time? You shift dignitaries. Do you think that Josephus... Or, or, or whoever, obviously Josephus who wrote this, and his cohort, his his group, said, we're monopolizing this time. So if you're going to write anything, you're going to have to place it in another time. Do you think that's what happened? Or do you think for their no, own No, no, it, it's not. No, I mean, listen. The year 70 is the big catastrophe of, of the Jewish realm. Okay, it's it's Jerusalem is destroyed. People are dispersed. Few people remain fighting on Masada for another three years. It's the end. It's the end of history there. You could write a story and nobody would know if it was true or not because everybody's either dead or gone. And especially since the Gospels were written, you know, outside. They were they were written after the Jewish war. Uh, and... And and they were written, you know, presumably in Greek, and they were written for another audience somewhere else. Okay. So you could have gotten away with writing anything. 
But there were other historians and there were other historians who were outside and who survived and who wrote the history of that period. And the most famous one is Josephus. The surviving one is Josephus. We know of at least one more, Justice of Tiberius, and there could have been others. But Josephus, he was a friend of Titus. I mean, this was a major player. You know, he had a statue in Rome. He has his books in, 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 in the libraries. This is not, not nobody. He was the, the historian of, of the people that people expected would not exist anymore. That was his, I mean, he, he's a very interesting guy, Josephus. He, he was, he was a, a commander in the war against the Romans and he switched sides. You know, he was a survivor, you could call it. But he had, and he became a friend of the Romans. He became part of the, of the, uh, of the court. But he had this thing. I'm, I have to save for posterity the history of my people. And so he wrote the, an enormous body of work, uh, especially about the first century, but not only, but especially about the first century. And, you know, and it, it's very detailed. And what's interesting is uh, there are a lot of people who are writing about whether Luke read uh, Josephus. Uh, I think he did because there are many phrases and, and ways of reasoning that are similar. In any event, if he didn't read Josephus, then the people who were putting together later uh, the Gospels and, and the other writings into the New Testament for sure knew about Josephus. There was an altern alternative narrative that was established. Um, you, if you write a religious story rather than just a historical story, I mean, history is always skewed, but it, it didn't have, but, uh, Josephus didn't have any religious sort of um, motivations, let's put it that way. So he he just wanted to tell the truth, be, albeit perhaps skewed, but that was the, the people who wrote both the Old Testament and the New Testament, they had to consider the religious needs. And so when Josephus, who hated the Messianic claimants, who hated the rebels, who called them all kinds of nasty names, and he, he did not like the Egyptian. I mean, he called him a false prophet, a, a charlatan. You know, you don't want to compete with that narrative. And so that is my hypothesis of why they would shift it. I don't know why they would shift it. I'm, I'm certain they did shift it because if you, if you look at, this, at, at the 30s, you don't find anything that fits, nothing. I mean, you may find names, but you don't find activities that fit. And, and we're talking dignitaries. We're not only talking Jesus here. And if you shift it, it suddenly all fits. Um, and you, and you I, gotta I keep, can only... You have to keep coming back to the show. We've got to have you keep doing this. <laughs> I, I, okay. Uh, I, I cannot be sure of why they shifted it, but my, my, my main uh, interpretation is that they didn't want to have competing narratives. Got a question for you then. Uh, Jesus, okay. Let's, let's go to an interesting part. You have two passages that usually are disputed over who you know Jesus is. The testimony in Flavinium, which some scholars, we're not even going to go into that, but they think there may be a core to it. Who cares if there is at the end of the day? It, it's been embellished. It's become this Jesus character has now become the Flavinium version for the Catholics, etc. Now, the other James, the brother of Jesus situation in Josephus, who do you think that Jesus was? Is he anywhere in the New Testament, in your opinion, that Jesus? And which Jesus? The James and then James, son oh, but of Damius. That's just like that's just like one line. That's I mean, what I'm saying. Why would they only mention this? Why would Josephus not? He goes in all this talk about the. Egyptian. You know, I, I I actually I actually, you know, I, so many people have done it before me, but I do in in the book. And I don't remember if I do it in the paper too. Just put up all the arguments why this is; these are interpolations. And I and I and I claim that that the the one about John the Baptist is as well, um, because you know, it, if Theodos is John the Baptist, then that's another person. And and one of the things that's so clear is that the narrative would flow much better if they didn't stick that 
paragraph in the middle. And that's true of both of them. You know, it's like it's there's a story. If you lift out the paragraph, the story sort of continues underneath or on, on each side of the paragraph. But that's not the only reason. The argument, there are lots of arguments why why this is, you know, you uh, you find you don't find it in origin. You find it in Eusebius. I mean, there are all kinds of uh, when it comes to to the testimony of Flavian. There are other arguments when it comes to the John uh, John the Baptist paragraph. In any event. It's the only thing there is. It's the only thing there is. Why would they name this guy Jesus? Question. Maybe his name was Jesus. I don't know. We only, if he's the Egyptian, that's not a name. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I just, I just wanted your thoughts of maybe, you know, cause they did John the Baptist was Theodos John. You know what I mean? And no, no. So that's kind of why I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm just using logic here and, and yeah. it doesn't really yeah. When we're looking at it like this, I'm just, I was just going logically where that goes. So I love this. Number one, I want to say this. My fans, I'm certain of, enjoy this, regardless of if they conclude where you're at with this. But this, how, well, I want to stick to your works, but I almost want to mention the, the, the guy, the king of kings, when it comes to historicity, Bart Ehrman, what's he think of the Egyptian? Have you ever dialogued with him? No, I think, yeah, if I remember, this is years back. I, I think I wrote to him and either he didn't write me back or he wrote me back very, like, I didn't have time to read, sorry, or something like that. Yeah. I, I, I know I wrote him and I know I didn't get into a dialogue. Uh, I don't remember if he did answer me or if he just asked if he didn't answer me or if he just answered me very, I don't have time. I think it was, I don't have time to read it. You, you said uh, that Josephus was saying that um, the Egyptian was a charlatan and these people, um, two questions. I hate doing two questions, but I know that I'll miss them because once you get dialogue going, it's tough to keep up. Number one, wasn't supposedly Josephus a rebel himself, supposedly. Um, and then number two, the Egyptian, does that also line up with the magic Jesus kind of ideas that this guy could have been more than just some hardcore Torah Orthodox guy? He he could have prob probably been like a, a healer type of well, messianic. Well, the whole thing about Egypt, if we should uh, remember the Josephus question, okay, and we'll take the, the, because the thing about Egypt, we haven't talked about it yet, but um. There are about four arguments, uh, and I line them up, why Jesus not only went to Egypt as a child and returned as a child, but that he actually returned as an adult, just like the Egyptian. Um, the first argument, um, now I don't want to rank them, but one of the arguments, they, let's say, is is the... Uh, very comparatively early, you could call it anti-Christian description uh, that you find with it, with, where there's a lot of description of Jesus, which is very early. It's it's Aletheus Logos uh, by Celsus that came around 175. And the only reason we have it is that Origen wrote a book called Contra Celsum, which was against Celsus. But he quotes Celsus there, and Celsus at length he quotes him. So Origen, the church father, writes a book to refute Celsus. And in this book, which is, um, you know, wherever he got that information, he claims that Jesus um, was came from a very poor single mother, and he went to Egypt, you know, as a young man, and he came back having learned magic skills. And this is what Celsus writes. He came back as an, as an adult, obviously, not as a, as a child. That's, that's, that's one. Two is that uh, the Talmud, uh, in, 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 in Talmud, you do find descriptions which are in general interpreted to be, and which were very controversial in the Middle Ages, and they had to strike them out, etc are considered references to Jesus. Uh, and he's there called Ben Stada or Ben Pantera. He's several names. But uh, uh, Celsus call, says, actually, that Jesus was the son of a soldier by the name of Pantera. So uh, so he's there called Ben Pantera. And Ben Pantera also comes from Egypt. 
and has learned magic skills. Um, comes back. Third argument is that in, in um, sort of the Middle Ages, and there are several uh, quotes of this, Christian authors wrote that the Jews called Jesus the Egyptian or the Egyptian the destroyer or that his father was called the Egyptian. And this, this is what Christian authors write that, that the Jews say about Jesus. Okay, so that's another, they call him the Egyptian. That's another argument. Another argument uh, is that when Jesus comes to Nazareth, you know, and he's like around 30 years old, and nobody recognizes him at first. Where has he been? And then when they start recognizing him, they connect him to his family, to his siblings. It's like, oh, it's that guy that we saw so many. Where has he been all those years? But the most important argument, I, I've listed. I <laughs> love this. The last one is, is the most important one. And that is in Matthew, where it says, now I don't remember the exact wording, but it says in the Gospel of Matthew, right after Jesus comes back as a child with his parents from Egypt, it says, at that time, John the Baptist started preaching in the wilderness. Now, John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. What is he doing preaching as a child? And, and it's not the only thing you find, you find there, but, but you... You, he starts preaching in the is it the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius? Now that's a very long time after the death of Herod the Great, which is when Jesus was was supposed to to return. That's about twenty three years later. So, so it seems that also there you find you have the indication that when Jesus did return from Egypt, he was not a child; he was an adult. And so, wow. this also fits with this whole concept the, there came out of egypt it says when, when josephus says there came out of egypt a man that said he was a prophet this is how he starts describing the egyptian and he came and and he and he went to the mount of olives and he started preaching to the masses that he was going to tear down the walls of jerusalem you've done a very good job on on this show letting me get a good picture of this person, I, I I have a fundamental question that I think is at the root of everyone watching this. All of this makes perfect sense. It really does. One thing I'd like to ask is who is writing this about him? And are they about writing whom? About, about this this Jesus character? Okay, yes, it's yeah. it's it's religious history, so to speak. It's more religious, in my opinion, than it is actual history, but they're trying to combine, which I've always thought there's something there. My question would be this. Are these people who wrote these New Testament books, do you think, and I know this is a hunch, I can only ask you what you think, because everyone has a motivation question. Oh, they wrote it to trick, or, or like we have people who come on the show who say the Romans wrote it, or we have some that come on and say, look, these were probably Jewish people who were part of mystery um, mystery cults that wrote these things. Do, who do you think these people were, and why did they write them about this person unless they maybe, and they made him look good. They didn't make him look bad. They made him look like he was cool with Rome, even though Rome's the one coming to kill them. It, it's just very complex, is it not? I, I think it was his disciples that started writing it. Um, and you have to also ask yourself, did he die on the cross or not? If he didn't, uh, what happened then? And uh, and that is my guess. Um, it's interesting when you come to, to Luke in Acts that s somebody is Luke, if you want to call him that, is writing for someone or someone seems to have been dictating to him, dear Th Theophilus. I mean... It seems like this is a story that's told. Um, now, who told it? That's 
this is so awesome though because something just comes up to me i i have to say like you brought up the whole point of the crucifixion this guy escapes okay they got the crucifixion and this supposed man named paul this is my problem this is my problem and and i think everyone watching this is with me at least to some extent that 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 actually follows what I, where i'm coming from this is a journey i'm on lena at miss einhorn um, <laughs> you can call it, me Lena. <laughs> I just don't want to be disrespectful, but why is Paul 20 years after the 30s supposedly doing this thing and saying this is the guy he was crucified or whether or not, you know, there's that dispute among whether he even knew a guy because he says, I got it from scripture. I got it from this. There's a crucified Jesus, right? And he's supposed to be right here. How's Paul? I just don't see how Paul wrote in the 50s. These scholars who say these are seven authentic. But listen, if it, if everything happened in the fifties, then the the gap in time is is very very small. So, but he believes in a crucified Jesus, or is that well, interpolation? Listen, I mean, we might as well. Uh, I don't know how far you got into the Jesus mystery, but I do have the hypothesis presented there, and I'm not claiming it's true. I'm throwing out the hypothesis that Jesus and Paul is the same person. Okay, okay. So I guess I'm getting into where they just need to get the book to figure this out, to at least I, consider. I'm not addressing it. I'm not addressing it in the second book, A Shift in Time, because it sort of clouds over everything. And this is how I started the whole thing. I, I can tell you this, how it all started. It started many years ago by someone saying, you know, Jesus didn't die on the cross. And I, you know, it was like this, oh, and then everything fell into place, you know. <laughs> you know, and it went, okay, so what, it went, it, you know, it, it all took a split second. No, okay, he 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 survived, he, he, uh, it, it was so, it was so, the, the, the Romans didn't, or Pilate didn't want to crucify him, it, uh, it was such a complex story. He he lives, he dies, he lives again, he dies again. What it, it it all it it you know it was split second. Wow, you know. And then I thought, okay, well, what happened then? Where did he go? If he said, you know, even if he survived in the way that 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 the gospels tell it. You know, if he was resurrected, whatever. Where did he go? What happened? And the, and the name Paul entered my, and that's why I started this whole exploration. Now, I didn't have a clue then that I was going to run into this time shift or that I was going to find anything with Josephus. I was just exploring this, and I did. I I did, and I still throw out. And I put in the first book the arguments for and against that Jesus and Paul could have been the same person. I don't claim with anything you know, sounding like certainty that this is the case, but I throw I threw out the possibility and I argue for it. I argue against it. The time shift, I feel much more on solid ground because there's so much evidence. But they don't the two things don't go against each other. And you know, there is one line in the gospel, in the Acts that basically, you know, it's written in two, it's written in, in layers. It's beautiful, this book, New Testament. It's amazing. If you look at, I think it's Acts 21, 38. Um, Paul comes back to Jerusalem. And he's been there before, and he's always hiding for some reason. And the explanation is different, but this time he goes to the temple. And uh, it says in Acts that he's recognized. And people want to kill him. And there's a big tumult. And the Roman commander comes and rescues him and takes him out. And before he does, he says, who is this guy? He asks, this is all in Acts. Who is this guy? He asks of the, uh, of the people in the temple. And it says, 
all these names were thrown out, but there was such a tumult he couldn't get a clear picture. I'm, I'm not quoting verbatim, but basically that's what it said. Then he takes him out. And then Jesus says to the commander, can I ask you a question? And the commander says, oh, you speak Greek. Then you are not the Egyptian who went out into the wilderness with 4,000 Sikari. Interesting. How did I miss this? It's the only time the Egyptian is mentioned in the New Testament. The only time. This is... And, and, okay, we, we got to speculate here. Everything's speculative. But if, but, if, but you know, he's, he's saying it to Paul. And Paul was definitely... <sighs> And would, do you have any, just asking you, I'm not, I want our audience who may not agree with this idea, okay, to try to have mercy and understand we're just, you know, playing with exploring. pieces. Exploring, okay, and this is nothing. And, and I want to say it again. I don't think the the idea of Jesus being Paul is in any way proven. But if there is one point in the New Testament where it's sort of actually where the finger points that way, it's that line, but uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not claiming anything with regards to that. I, I think we all get that, and and you know, I'm with you. Like, I don't want stones to be thrown. Um, I do want, you know, I, I like exploration though. And I don't want you to feel like you can't say something because, oh, what are people going to think? I don't care. I have, I have guys like Joseph. No, Atwell I mean, on, and, the re and the reason, the reason I didn't even bring that up in the second book, the sh shift in time is because it clouds everything and it's not. And, and the, and the time shift is so solid that I, I want it to stand on its own merits and not be clouded by this big issue let's put it that Paul's way jesus oh we can't uh, listen to her now right I, no it's not only that it's not it's not that they can't listen to me but that it because it takes over you know uh it's mm -hmm. it's it's it has but so, so a bottom line bottom line is i do think i am not a mythicist i do think jesus existed i do think he was uh very similar in many ways, or I think he's he is described in the New Testament as he was, but he was a rebel, and the and the sort of the the rebel part of him is under the surface. It's it's sort of in little like why why should they bring swords to the Mount of Olives? I mean, it comes in little spurts. It's not there very obvious, but in principle. I believe the New Testament is a historical text. Do you think he was, well, two questions. Something in pairs keeps coming to me. So first question I'd like to ask without going back to the Gospels too far is Saul becoming Paul. Does that have any significance to your theory when we're exploring? And the second question would be when we look at the New Testament and we see Jesus talking to Samaritans, I'm sure that's significant because you bring up in the historical chasm or the shift in time, so to speak, there's not really any issues between Jews and Samaritans anywhere in the time the New Testament puts it. It's before and it's after that anything well, it's, happens. It's, it's, there's a war. There's a Galilean-Samaritan war between 48 and 52. And you cannot say, or one cannot say that, you know, they're completely at peace with each other. But but Josephus does not mention any animosity outside of those 48 to 52. And the interesting thing is that the New Testament also has a specific period of animosity, and that is in the gospel times. Whereas when you look in Acts, the, the uh, Samaritans are mentioned a number of times and there's no hint of animosity. So you do have a period of animosity in the gospels, and you do have a period of animosity in Josephus but they're 20 years apart. Okay. Uh, Jesus. Uh, okay. We did the, the, what about uh, Paul being Saul, Saul being Paul? Is there anything there? Uh, I don't know. Um, listen, um, I'm, now I'm really out speculating. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to myth vision podcast. Let's say that, that, uh, 
Jesus in the time when he was in uh, in uh, uh, Judea and Galilee was a, a rebel leader. Let's say he escaped. Now there are two periods, and something brought out the peace-loving, the Jesus as we know him, and I. It may have ha happened in that particular shift between before and after the crucifixion, or whatever you want to, the end, the end time there. It became a, a religion that was preaching, you know, um, it had a more peaceful message than what was happening during the extremely, you know, this was an extremely, uh, it was an apocalyptic time, um, the first century. I mean, it was the end of the world as they knew it. It was very violent. Uh, there was it was a time of of survival. It was a time of messianism. It was uh, it was rebellion was what the time was all rebellion and 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 messianism and the end of times was what the the first century was in history in reality. Um. That was not that was not the message that Paul was preaching. Strange. Yeah, that is strange. You asked me something else before, and that's about Josephus. If he was a rebel, yes. Josephus was an aristocrat. Josephus was the opposite of the rebels. The rebels were like peasants. They were to a large extent. Galileans. I thought he was they imprisoned, were, though. I thought he got captured in a war, hey, supposedly. Listen, that's yes, it's because what happens when you approach the Jewish war is that everybody becomes a rebel, or rather, everybody becomes a fighter. It's like the aristocracy and the leadership and the and the rabbis. They were they didn't want to fight with the Romans. The rebels wanted to, fight, and there was this tension. And and it got worse and worse. You got some really awful Roman procurators. And in the end, you couldn't stop it. And once you couldn't stop it, people like Josephus joined the fight. And because he was such a prominent person, he was an aristocrat. He had been he'd been living in Rome. In 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 he was he was the the uh, emperor's uh, Nero's wife's close confidant. I mean, he was living in. He, you know, he was not your typical rebel, but he became a commander in the Jewish war. He became one of the two competing commanders in the Galilee. Um, and and so he's not a rebel, but he, he becomes a fighter in the Jewish war. Uh, and he hated he hated the rebels. That's why his history, his depiction, it may be skewed. Too much the other direction. I mean, he painted them in such black colors that it's not a pleasant read. You know, he's he hates he hates the 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 robbers. So so th that's why you know he say they destroyed our country. So he has a very very negative image, a very negative picture of of these people. So anybody who who wanted to put this messianic movements in the in a good light, you didn't want to be compared to Josephus's writings because he didn't like them. Wow, this was such a good show. Um, I definitely want to put a hold on there, and um, we will definitely go into some other interesting things on another podcast. If you guys are watching this, ladies and gentlemen, please do me a favor. I want to bring her back. Go down in the description. Make sure you guys get the book because. Ask questions. If you have questions, put them down in the comment section, and I make sure that when we do our next interview, I'll pick out some questions from you guys so that we can ask her, and uh, you guys will be more aware of the position too because I'm going to be reading this and going into this more. Do you have anything you'd like to say to end this show um, to the audience? To keep an open mind, um, I think – we all suffer from not only preconceived notions, but ideas that we hang on to and uh, 
and we love our ideas and that's true of me and it's true of everybody and uh, and it's the hardest thing is to keep an open mind that's that's one thing um and the other thing is a new testament is one of the most incredible books it's like a mystery novel it's like a puzzle i mean, we have a swedish term puzzle mystery it's so well cleverly written and not a word is there for no reason it's mm. everything means something um it's so cleverly written it's amazing um and yeah and um hey Another thing I would like to say, as I'm now doing the same operation on the Old Testament, and uh, people are already, I'm getting some expert readers who are like screaming out loud. Um, <laughs> I don't think that people make up history as a rule. They may need to skew history. They may need to push history one way or another. They may need to adjust history, but people have a really strong need to tell the story. And I, that's why I'm not a mythicist. I don't believe people construct stories out of thin air. I think they do it for a reason and that they base the story on reality. You got me at one uh, question. So many questions. You know, I'm thinking of like Romulus and like if there were other deities that might be like, you know, but but then again, that's a different show for a different time, maybe that we could just talk about different things. But even that's not your field. That's not your area necessarily. I just there's so I, I agree. There's I agree. I agree. There's something there for sure. And I I wonder, you know, I hear these scholars say these Old Testament characters did not exist. And so. What does that mean? Does that mean that there was no basis to reality on these people in history? Are they based off other people maybe? Uh, I have other guests that come on this show too, Miss Einhorn. And sorry if you don't mind me saying that. I'm just from the South. So like my mom and dad always taught me to say Mrs. Mr. You know, and just be, be <laughs> okay. kind to people. Um, but they look to find who these guys are. And like I have a guy named Ralph Ellis. He comes on. He talks about. He thinks that they're Egyptian. So like Adam and Eve is probably Akhenaten and Nefertiti, you know, and there's like shift in either place, time or something where they're using the story. And it's uh, it's obviously not necessarily exactly what we're reading, but there's something else going on usually. And they're still saying yeah. that they're historical people. And then others right. say they don't exist. Like I, um, lots of critical scholars say like Moses didn't really exist. But then there's some who say yeah, but once again, here we are. There's probably a guy. It's just not what you're reading necessarily, but there's probably some truth to it. And I'd, I'd really be looking forward to your book that's coming out. And when that gets are launched, the new one? Yeah, the we'll do a one? show on it's that. It's coming in Swedish this fall, and I'm going to translate it uh, to English probably myself to to do it pretty quickly. Um, but we can talk about it once it's out. I'm <sighs> I'm. Um, I think it's the same thing with the Old Testament. It's it's basically true history, but it has been adjusted for religion. Religion demanded it, so to speak. Well, in case you're wondering and anyone else, <laughs> we are Myth Vision. <laughs>